So uh, I would like to talk about uh, some recent work <clears throat> done at DESI in collaboration with Markus Wieriegel, Fabian Rühle, and Julian Schweitzer, which uh, is the work I talk about is contained in these two papers. One came out uh, a little more than a week ago, <clears throat> is this one. The other is <coughs> essentially finished and will be out, I think, in a, a few days. So uh, let me start with some uh, very uh, simple questions everybody knows. I think it's well known that fermions and bosons play very different roles uh, in the standard model. Now, quarks and leptons come in three copies of complete gut, rep uh, gut representations, whereas gauge bosons and Higgs bosons form single, incomplete, sometimes called uh, split multiples. Now, uh, in the following, in this talk, I would like to argue uh, that uh, there may be a simple reason behind that which explains this difference, namely a connection between gut symmetry breaking and supersymmetry breaking. Now, uh, so the result will then be that the scalar quarks and scalar leptons, the partners, Susie partners of the quarks and leptons, they are very heavy because they belong to complete gut multiplets. And because of that, they also come in several copies, three not being distinguished. Whereas a supersymmetry breaking should be small for gauge and Higgs fields because they form incomplete gut multiplets. So that is, the, uh, the argument is, there should be kind of a double split. Either uh, you have, if you look at the multiplets, you have a split in uh, supersymmetry, a split supersymmetry multiplet, but then you have a complete gut multiplet. Or the other way around, you have a split gut multiplet and then small Susy splitting. That is the picture of uh, split supersymmetry as uh, suggested by uh, these people. And in fact, I should say uh, to us, this outcome was a little bit of a surprise. We were not planning to work on that. Rather, we were thinking about constructing a D-term uh, model of inflation uh, in, from extra dimensions. So in order to explain what is behind this uh, statement, let me start with a few uh, technical points concerning uh, compactification of supergravity on orbifolds with Wilson lines and flux. So we consider 60 supergravity with a U1 gauge field to start with. It will become a little complicate, more complicated later. And we look at uh, the compactification on the torus. So then uh, the standard metric, as you know, is this. You have the four-dimensional metric, for us essentially the Minkowski space. You have the internal metric of the compact space, rescaled by uh, the radion field. That's a six-dimensional metric. And uh, here you see the uh, lattice corresponding to the torus, uh, the fundamental domain. And then, as you know, on the torus, you can have uh, two Wilson lines, so one going in this direction, one going uh, in this direction. And you can write, uh, write them as uh, a line integral over the gauge field. <clears throat> now, what will be uh, important in the following discussion is uh, the following. It's uh, not really important, but I think, say, helpful, is the following. If, let's now go to the orbifold. So that means uh, we take uh, this thing and take half of it, which is a fundamental domain. So here you see this fundamental domain, which now has uh, four fixed points. And as you know, uh, in order to get uh, the orbifold, you, uh, you uh, fold this thing around this line and you get the well-known pillow with these four corners. So topologically, as you know, the orbifold is a sphere with four points uh, taken out. Now, uh, therefore, on the orbifold, you have uh, canonical, I would say, um, one cycles, which in fact just uh, encircle these uh, 
fixed points. So you have one here, one here, one here, one here. And uh, here you see uh, the projections of the Wilson lines on the torus to the orbifold. So this one Wilson line now is this, <coughs> the other one is this. And you can decompose it in this way. You can write, say, this Wilson line as uh, the sum of Wilson lines around uh, these uh, fixed points, uh, T1 in this way, T2 in this way. Now, uh, as you also know, once you are on the orbifold, uh, you no longer have continuous Wilson lines, but they are discrete. And if you look at this uh, line integral, the exponent of that, uh, then it's quantized and uh, you have essentially a parity that means these factors can only take the values uh, plus minus one. This is well known. Now, <clears throat> let's introduce, in addition, a flux. So we have, say, a gauge field, somehow characterizing the, the Wilson lines, and we have now a flux, which uh, is constant on uh, this orbifold. Then we know the flux on the orbifold is quantized also in this way. And the total background field is now the field uh, related to the flux. And in addition, it's the orbifold field. The orbifold field produces no flux. So uh, if you have, say, you can have fractional flux at uh, different fixed points, but they add up to a total of zero. And then, as you know, what is important for the following discussion as the flux generates chiral zero modes due to the index theorem. So in our case, that means if we have, say, with a minus sign here, if n is positive, we have n flux quanta, then we have n left-handed uh, fermions. So we have chiral, so with flux, we have uh, just a number of chiral zero modes. Okay. Now, let's look in more detail at uh, 60 supergravity. The uh, uh, Lagrangian, or the action for that is well known. You have, of course, a metric. You have a dilaton field. You have uh, the field strength of the anti-symmetric tensor field, uh, B. And uh, we have now the field strength of a U1 gauge field. And then one includes in the field strength uh, here uh, trend Simon's terms. Uh, for uh, the uh, spin connection, Lorentz, local Lorentz symmetry, and for uh, the U1 gauge field, which is this one. In our discussion, we will ignore uh, gravitational anomalies. So I can comment on that if you want. So we will, in the following, ignore uh, this term. Then, if you now consider also flux on this orbifold, it turns out you have to redefine uh, your tensor field in such a way so that you can do the usual uh, proper kaluza klein expansion. And uh, so you have then, once you do this redefinition, you can write the derivative of uh, the tensor field as, say, uh, the, the two form on your compact space times the derivative of a scalar. Little b is now a real scalar plus uh, another three form. And this derivative of this tensor field is we are interested in the 4D action then this is uh, this uh, field will not depend on the coordinates of the compact space. Having this, you can, in a straightforward way, derive, uh, write the field strength of this um, anti-symmetric tensor field in this form. So we have the scalar here, which comes together with this fluctuation. And you see it's proportional here to the flux, which you have, and then the rest. Now, uh, there is a, if you are familiar with this, there is a standard way of how to uh, manipulate uh, the thing if you want to uh, derive uh, the 4D effective action. You dualize uh, this field strength. That means you of, of this thing here now. So you trade this for another real scalar C. And then um, you also, uh, instead of radion and dilaton, introduce uh, two other scalar fields called T and S. That's a standard procedure. And uh, now, 
uh, we are ready to discuss the anomaly cancellation. A crucial problem in this business is the anomaly cancellation, for which can be done for, uh, in fact, by adding a green Schwarzstern. Now, this is well known for the case of the orbifold. You know, once you have an orbifold with, uh, uh, <clears throat> which generates, say, uh, a zero mode, uh, then uh, you know that the anomaly cancellation for that, uh, that means, uh, can be done just by this uh, green Schwarz term. But, uh, and that cancels the anomaly, on the one hand, the bulk anomaly, and then the fixed point anomalies, which you have in this orbifold, so that is all uh, fine. However, what created a puzzle for us, and what, to my knowledge, had not been discussed before in the literature, is the following. If you now introduce a flux, you get, in addition, zero modes due to the index theorem. So you have the bulk anomaly, you have uh, the four-dimensional anomaly associated with these zero modes, and you have uh, fixed-point anomalies on the orbifold. And the question is, what do you do about these anomalies? Well, and it turns out that if you work this out uh, properly, then in the end you don't have to worry about that because this Simon's term automatically takes care also of the new zero modes. The way that works is you insert here uh, now the full gauge field. That means the background field plus uh, the fluctuations and then uh, due to the quantization of the flux, you automatically get the contributions, which also cancels uh, the anomaly due to the zero modes. So if you work this out, then finally your full action has the following form. You have the field strength for your U1 uh, gauge field. You have a classical, this is a flux, you have a classical contribution to the energy density. You have uh, the B field, this real scalar uh, together with the vector field. You have this additional field scalar here, again, together with the vector field. And you have a linear combination of these two real scalars coupled to this uh, trend Simons form. So the physics of that is that one linear combination of the two real scalars, which are contained in the anti-symmetric tensor field, uh, combine to make uh, the vector massive, so that's the Stückelberg mechanism, a version of the Stückelberg mechanism, whereas the other linear combination remains a massless field coupled in the standard way to uh, the gauge field. So that you can easily write uh, like this. Uh, you find that's sort of the end of uh, the story. You find the field strength here of uh, your U1 this classical contribution to the energy density, the mass term for this vector field, and here the coupling of this, the kinetic term for this one massless axion, and here it's coupling to the U1 gauge field. And if you look at the formulae which you have for this vector boson, for this kinetic term, for this coupling, then you see here uh, always a factor n, which denotes the number of flux quanta. That means, uh, you can now construct uh, various limits. For instance, one is where you put flux, you put the flux to zero. Then you just get the usual Stückelberg mechanism and you get uh, the mass for the vector field just from the anomaly term. If there is also the flux, you can have just the flux without even a fermion, then just classically you generate a vector boson mass. Or you can have the linear combination of both then uh, what enters is, uh, in these uh, expressions is a flux. It's uh, the uh, term from the anomaly, and that gives you the mass for the vector boson and also for the couplings. And what is interesting is you can now construct wave functions uh, also for the bulk fields, which you have uh, on uh, this orbifold. In fact, for that, in fact, for this whole work, what is very important is a paper written a number of years ago by Bacas, uh, who had some wave functions on the torus. There were extensions on the torus, also on the orbifold. And uh, then you can get explicit expressions for uh, these wave functions. First of all, let me say what the spectrum is. The mass spectrum, 
What is well known since this work of Bacchus is that if you go away from the orbifold and you introduce a background flux, the spectrum changes drastically. You don't have the usual thing with Wilson lines. Rather, uh, the spectrum is now independent of the Wilson lines. And instead, you have uh, a spectrum for the scalars. This starts with 0 here. So 4 pi n over the volume, the 2 volume would be the mass uh, squared of these scalars. And then for the fermions, if you take here n equal to 0, then you see you get 0 modes and a zero mode, and also you get a heavy one. So the 60 y fermion splits into two components, one of which is massless, and the other one massless. It combines in the kaluza klein tower. You get nice wave functions, and uh, just watch here. If you have the full dots, it means that the wave function at these fixed points is non-zero. So this is a situation with flux, no Wilson lines. Now you can introduce Wilson lines, and then you see that uh, this uh, pattern changes. You now get, at two fixed points, you now get uh, vanishing uh, values of the wave functions. That's indicated by these empty little circles. And on some points, say here and here, the full points, you get non-vanishing wave functions. And then as you change the pattern of the Wilson lines, uh, that changes where the wave functions are zero or not. But if you take, say, these canonical cycles, you can immediately, and assigning fractional flux to them, you can immediately understand where the wave functions are zero or not and how qualitatively such a pattern of wave functions should look like. So this is a kind of technical introduction. Let me now come to the main point. And uh, so this way of how you get zero modes, on the one hand from uh, the singularities of the orbifold, on the other hand from the flux. If you are familiar with, say, guts in higher dimensions, as discussed by, say, Ol Nomura and uh, uh, a number of people in the past, you immediately realize that there may be an interesting possibility. And I will illustrate that with uh, one, say, SO10 gut in six dimensions which a couple of years was discussed by Asaka, uh, Kovi and myself, and also uh, Hall Nomura. So there you have as bulk fields 45 plat, you have a 16 plat, a 16 bar, and 10 plats, the standard SO10 representations in the bulk. And we will now, and the nice thing, or the, the way the symmetry is broken in this model is that you have a fixed point with a, a pillow with four corners. And in fact, you can break uh, at fixed points by adding Wilson lines as the symmetries uh, in the following way. In the bulk, you have a symmetry SO10, which is unbroken at one fixed point. At another fixed point, by adding a Wilson line, you break it to the Patti-Salam group. At the other fixed point, to Georgi Glashow, standard SU5. And then here, automatically, it's broken to flipped SU5. And then you get the standard model out as the standard model gauge group as an intersection of uh, these uh, four gut groups, which you have at these different fixed points. So this is the picture. And now uh, let's extend SO10 to SO10 cross U1. Let's add an anomalous U1. Typically, this is what you would expect if you do heterotic string compactification. So if you embed this in E8, you have uh, the minimal group would be, say, SO10 times U1 cubed. And it's anomalous, and then and you will have a more complicated sector. So in some sense, we are aiming at uh, constructing a subsector here. Now, at these different um, fixed points, you now have the standard decompositions of the edge representation, the 10 plate, uh, the 16 plate. And what you do at these fixed points is that you always project out certain parts. So for instance, at uh, the standard SU5 uh, fi fixed point, you keep for one 10, you keep only the 5. From another 10, you keep the 5 star. Uh, for the, at the Patizalam fixed point, you just keep the SU2 fields. You throw away uh, the color fields. And so this is the way you realize the double triplet split. So from these projections, you uh, break the gut symmetry, and you reduce the complete SO10 representations 
to split multiplets as far as zero modes are concerned. So from, for the Higgs, which comes from these templates, you are left in the end with uh, two Higgs doublets. And from this bulk, uh, 16 plates, you are left with fields which can break uh, E minus L. This is the old picture. And uh, now what is known is if you have uh, just this, then uh, you have uh, the usual picture of uh, gut breaking by orbifold boundary conditions, and you get a split hit Higgs uh, sector, the double triplet splitting. And you can cancel the anomalies by means of a Green Schwartz uh, term. But now, what is interesting, if we have uh, the U1 and we add uh, now flux and we treat this U1 as the chiral symmetry, that means we assign, say, U1 charge. Uh, say, just to the 16 plate and not to the other fields, then we generate, in addition to these uh, split multiplets, you, you generate uh, copies of uh, complete gut multiplets. So for instance, if I take the 16 plate here, give it a charge Q, and add now the quantized flux, then depending on the number of flux, flux quanta, which I have on my orbifold, I will generate a couple of 16 plates as zero modes. So these will be my fermions. And you see, uh, the point is now, if a field transforms non-trivially under this anomalous U1, then you will get, on the one hand, a multiplicity. And on the other hand, you will get a complete gut representation. So that always comes together. So the fact, in that sense, if you look at the quarks and leptons, the fact uh, that, they are, that we have three copies of them is tied uh, to the fact that they are complete gut multiplets. Whereas if you look at Higgs and gauge fields, they, have no, uh, they don't feel this anomalous U1. Therefore, you don't have multiplicities. You don't have copies. And you don't have complete gut multiplets. They come as split multiplets. So that um, is uh, somehow the observation, which is related to this, uh, the way the symmetry is realized. And uh, then the other thing is now, of course, what is crucial is, due to this work of Bacchus, that this way uh, of having gut multiplets and split multiplets on the one hand and the other hand is directly related to the way you have supersymmetry breaking. But before I come to that, let me first uh, discuss what you can now learn in such a model about Yukawa couplings, because there are some implications for the flavor structure. <clears throat> As I said, at these fixed points, these um, multiplets are projected. And uh, now you can have, for instance, at one fixed point, you have the coupling 16, 16, 10, 16, 16, uh, 10 to another 10. And uh, you have always, for each bulk field, you have one coupling. This is a coupling which is given here. If you go to another fixed point where the symmetry is broken, you can have couplings which are uh, compatible with the unbroken group. So here is U5, so you have one coupling more. Here, Patti's alarm, you again have a, a coupling less, and flip less U5. And now, uh, if you now have the flux for the zero modes, is uh, you, uh, the single coupling turns into a matrix, simply because the 16 plate, say, becomes uh, three copies of zero modes. And uh, these uh, three copies of uh, zero modes, uh, then for them, you have uh, different products of wave functions at the corresponding fixed points. And in this way, the complete superpotential for all the zero modes look now like this. You have the couplings, which you can have for the bulk fields. And they always come together with a matrix, which just depends on the fixed point. So at the fixed point, you get uh, matrices which are determined by the flux, flux quantum numbers and also uh, the geometry. That fixes uh, 
these uh, matrices, and then you have, in addition, these couplings which come from this. Now, to work that out in detail is something which we are looking at at the moment. But now, let me come to the main point. As I, yeah, as I try to explain, uh, this idea of uh, assigning an anomalous U1 uh, in the bulk, so to start from the group of SO10 cross U1, uh, gives you uh, uh, copies for complete gut multiplets and uh, just single uh, fields uh, for split multiplets, for split gut multiplets. Now, uh, the flux also introduces supersymmetry breaking. That's due to this work uh, of Bacchus. So you will have a universal scalar mass plus kaluza klein excitations. So the lightest scalar quarks and leptons will have a universal mass, which is uh, 4 pi n, where n is the number of flux quanta. In our case, n is 3. So it will be this in units of the volume of the compact dimensions. Now, I should say the volume of the compact dimensions, here's a dynamical quantity, because it depends on the radion field. So it has to be determined from uh, modular stabilization. And of course, this is something, well, work on that you can find in the literature. We are trying to understand, looking at that now also. And uh, <clears throat> of course, what you then get from that has to be consistent for this mass, to be consistent with gauge coupling unification and with proton decay. So that puts some constraints. But typically, this mass, this scalar mass, will be of order the gut scale, say 10 to the 15 GeV. Now, uh, so that means at three level, you start from a spectrum where only the scalar quarks and masses, because they are in a complete gut multiplet, are massive. And they all have masses of the order of the gut scale. The rest at three level is massless. Now, uh, <clears throat> so that means gravitino, gegino, sixino, six boson, and so on. they are all massless. Then uh, the flux introduces uh, an energy density which corresponds to D-term breaking. Therefore, you generate a gravitino mass. I think that's unavoidable. So typically, if this is, say, 10 to the 15 GeV, the gravitino mass will be around, say, 10 to the 12 uh, GeV. Then it depends what happens now with the normal mediation, quantum corrections, and all that. So in the standard picture, one would say I have a normal mediation, and uh, then uh, I, if this is 10 to the 12 C GeV, I will generate gagino masses, say, between 10 to the 9, uh, between, uh, say, 10 to the 10, 10 to the 9 GeV, roughly, also very heavy. The biggest protection you have uh, for the hexinos and the charginos, they can be even lighter. How what their mass is depends on the way you treat the quantum corrections for that, but uh, that remains to be seen. So in any case, qualitatively, the spectrum will be that you have really a universal squawk and slepton mass of roughly the gut scale, maybe a little bit smaller, much bigger than the gravitino mass, much bigger than the gagino and uh, hexino masses. Now, what comes out in detail, I think we are learning now about the topic because for us this is rather new. Uh, it depends on how you treat the quantum corrections in detail. And um, you, will, uh, you may have the typical uh, split supersymmetry mechanism with everybody in the TV range, or you may have spread uh, supersymmetry where the lightest are the hexinos, the gaginos are a little bit heavier, or if all that becomes too heavy, you may just have the standard model and an axion. But that's a question of the quantum corrections. And of course, you have now all the problems well known from split supersymmetry of the fine tuning, how do you understand the Fermi scale and all that. I have nothing to say about that. We are also just looking now again at these problems. But at least um, there are, I, I hope to make yeah, the main point clear, namely that the fact whether you have complete uh, gut multiplets or not is related to the multiplicity 
and to the size of supersymmetry breaking. And if you take such a picture, then you essentially qualitatively get out the picture of split supersymmetry. And uh, of course, it would be very nice if one would find some evidence for that at the LSC, which could be light exinos. Okay, so we have time for a couple questions. Yes. I understood that if you take into account the, 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 the bound on the Higgs mass, I mean the, the value of the Higgs mass, the, that rules out uh, the squares and the leptons at uh, the God scale. Have you considered that, that the, all this has to be consistent with the 125 GeV Higgs? Well, of course, I mean, how, uh, I mean, I'm aware of that, but we have not yet that worked out. I mean, of course, you have, once you have this picture, there's fine tuning for the Higgs the well-known fine-tuning of split supersymmetry for the Higgs, as well as radiative symmetry break. Yeah, but on top of that, in principle, uh, you see that there's this plot in this uh, paper by Judith et al., where you see that the, 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 um, there's a, a line of the Higgs mass, and then see how the split SUSI fits, and it brings the value of the, yeah, yeah, uh, the no, split that's very, the, very, very, yeah, very small. Yeah, then the, at that point, the question is what split SUSI means. Yes. I think what split SUSI means in that paper is not what it is here, because that's a special assumption, I think, on uh, the masses of the other particles. On which, well, we can discuss. Yeah, we can discuss. Yeah, okay. mm -hmm. uh, just a question. Typically in six dimensional models, when you uh, compute the masses of scalars, very often they become tachyonic. Uh, yours are positive definite all the time, or? I think so. I don't see what, you mean the scalar masses here? Yes. I don't <clears throat> see what would, them, would make them tachyonic here. The, 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 the term, the, the term can make it. Well, no, but that the is... The term can work in the nice and the wrong direction, positive and definite. Well, and I think negative. this is, as far as I understood, and talking to some people, this is sort of uh, established that for... I mean, this is essentially the mass spectrum worked out by Bacchus. So then... Uh, so. Bacchus, I think, didn't even ask the question, what kind of supersymmetry breaking you have? I mean, he just calculated the mass spectrum for which you need, uh, essentially, that um, uh, once you have this flux, I mean, the wave functions behave like harmonic oscillator wave functions. Then you get this kind of spectrum that was generalized uh, to the case of the orbifold, and it was also figured out that I think uh, the vacuum energy density, which you generate by the flux, corresponds to a D-term breaking. As you know, <clears throat> later on we did a more detailed computation with Cremades et al. Yeah. And uh, I think you get uh, both signs in the spectrum, positive and negative. But uh, I don't well, know. I mean, I in the presence of the orifold, it's true that the orifold can project out some of the negative states. Okay, I mean, this is something uh, we have to, I mean, we look at your paper in connection with these wave functions, and in fact, we uh, learned a lot from that. What that means for the masses of the scalar particles, I. I don't know, but I would be glad for, to learn more about that. All right, one more quick question. Okay, I don't know it's a question or comment. Um, if you think about the stabilization of radius or Dirac to yes. cancel, then I think generically, you can do this, but generically, F term of these things could be easily generated, okay? Because you have supersymmetry breaking and you have radius T, F, yes. and if the F term of these things are generated, naively it's this size of uh, gut scale or compactification scale, and if that's the case, Gejino will also get the mass. Of course, you can kill that by going to no scale type of scale or whatever you yeah. can do it, but you may need additional thing to get actually this, it, once you yes. think about all these dynamics of these. Yes, I yeah. fully agree. I mean, what happens now, uh, whether there are other sources of supersymmetry yes, yes, one has to take it. into account, and what that does to the rest of the spectrum. It could change. change remains to be seen. Yeah, I, I agree. Great. So let's uh, thank the speaker again.